Hello, it is another beautiful Monday, wherever you are, it's Monday now, and we're talking about news in the ML space, welcome. A lot of stuff happening this week. First and foremost, open release of Grok 1. Elon has done it. The mad lad openly releasing the Grok model that powers XAI or Twitter AI or however you want to call that. It's a 314 billion parameter model. Of course, of course, it's probably going to require 69 GPUs to run. But this is a large language model that's been trained. And if you have tried Grok, then you know it's kind of more quippy, a bit more sarcastic and so on in tone and in nature than other models in line with the sort of free speech approach that Elon has announced when taking over Twitter. So this is a huge model. This is bigger than like GPT-3. They have very competent people training this. So people have looked into the code base. It does seem quite reasonable what they've done. I know that Grok hasn't been like a success from a commercial perspective, but the model so far seems quite legit. Whatever you think of Elon, this is really cool. This is really, really cool. Model weights and code are available under Apache 2.0 license fully usable, fully open source. Yeah, crazy, crazy. You can check out the code. The code, by the way, it's a flat repository, flat GitHub repository. There's model.py and model.py is just 1400 lines of, of code. Very, very cool. Very cool. It's uh, made in Jax. I think it's excellent. So I think, yeah, whatever you think of Elon, of X and so on, this is a step into the right direction, not just an open release of such a large model, but explicitly making this a true open source license. And I think that deserves a lot, a lot of compliments. Next news, NVIDIA has their GTC conference this year, and they have announced really, really big GPUs, I guess. So they have new chips, and these new chips are called Blackwell. Uh, this is from Yahoo Finance. And if you can see in the background right here, they have a few new things. Um, notably, they are about double as fast as the previous generation, and they do FP4. They have FP4 tensor cores, floating point numbers with four bits. I'm not sure how that's going to work. Usually if people quantize down beyond like eight bits, they go to integer quantization. FP4 and FP6 going to be interesting to see what's being done. I'm sure NVIDIA has done the required tests in kind of scaling models up to know that this is going to be useful in the future. Otherwise, they wouldn't bet an entire future generation of GPUs on these things. But it's going to be very, very cool to see. I don't know, like you think back to old computers, how they had eight kilobytes of RAM, and you think all oh, the people were crazy. Maybe we're going to think back to FP64 and FP32 times and be like, oh, these people were crazy. They just had way too much precision on these calculations. All that's actually needed is like half a bit you're like half a bit flipping half on eventually <laughs> and that's all that's required for a large language model so yeah nvidia gtc lots of announcements there also groot a foundation model for humanoids so nvidia going very much into humanoid robotics they announced how they invented or how they envisioned the future there will be groot foundation model which is sort of a pre-trained model to handle a variety of humanoid robot interactions and so on so the group model will take in sensory data like vision, language and so on, and then be able to translate that into actions that a humanoid robot can execute. They support the same thing with their what they call Omniverse, which is sort of a VR environment where they envision a lot of the training of these things happen. So humanoid robots interacting with different terrain, with the world, and so on. And they also have on-device compute, compute things with their Jensen's that there are very power efficient local accelerators that can actually be put onto a robot. They've also announced a general support for ROS, the robot operating system, which is also pretty cool because that's widely used in robotics and is a common standard. And lastly, Anshel Sag tweeting out this, the scariest, most terrifying thing I've seen at NVIDIA GTC. <laughs> Jeez. That has some Jurassic Park vibes right there. All right, this is a new section called Comment of the Week. 
And it's either a comment on one of my videos or a general comment I found online. This week, Igor Babushkin tweeting out, the Grok 1 repo is getting very popular. I'll be responding to poll requests and issues. Feel free to continue. So this, this is one of the maintainers of the Grok repository. And you can see uh, Mistral, yellow line, oh, not so many stars over time. Llama, ooh, many stars, especially... Uh, with new releases. And then Grok, oh, all the stars, the, the, the breakthrough. Uh, Arthur Mench, the CEO of Mistral, quoted this and saying, congratulations, interesting how GitHub stars seem to correlate with superfluous parameters, Chad. In other cool big news, people are brute forcing the OpenAI API to figure out model names that aren't openly advertised by OpenAI, but are still accessible via the API if you know their name. There has been a long, long list released, and I can link that. I'll also follow this person on Twitter for more updates. This person in turn uh, has the complete list from a post on 4chan. So I know, I know, I know. These are just kind of names in a text file so it's not guaranteed that all of them are true but various people have confirmed they can actually reach these models via the API so this is you can see there's a long 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 list of models among others there are interesting ones like Jane Street there are others like superhuman which unfortunately isn't a superhuman AI as this person here points out it is rather a reference to an email client but very very interesting that the way OpenAI sort of of stages new models or stages models for certain companies. We don't know if these are the same models, they just call them differently in order to track usage or something like this, or if they are kind of test models, or if they are prompted in a certain way or fine tuned in a certain way, we don't know. GPT-4 Duolingo, we don't know if it's trained on Duolingo data or if it, the company Duolingo is actually involved. We don't know any of that. Right. And I also expect that this loophole, I guess, will be patched within the next three seconds or so. Now that this is widely being distributed, I guess I'm contributing to that. But for as long as it's still there, you can absolutely reach these models via the OpenAI API. You see, this list is huge, huge, huge. Alpha internal. That sounds interesting. TechCrunch writes, after raising $1.3 billion, inflation is eaten alive by its biggest investor, Microsoft. This is a huge amount of money, right? And inflation has been raising tons of money to build a personal AI assistant that you could talk to in a natural way and so on. This article here by TechCrunch goes a bit into the history of the company and details how they have never really truly reached that goal of making this super personal AI such that it was kind of so far different or ahead of other one other of these assistant models so that people would want to use it over chat GBT or things like this. So in that sense, they kind of sort of failed or just not achieved the breakthrough they needed being valued multiple billions of dollars. But also Microsoft has been the lead investor. Microsoft seems to have the strategy of investing, 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 and then just kind of taking over these startups they invest in. So this announcement is that two of the three co-founders have now go gone to Microsoft from inflection and are starting what's called Microsoft AI, which is a new division within Microsoft. So within Microsoft, there's now Microsoft AI forming a team from what I can guess will focus on AI, I guess. Is probably going to be kind of LLM research and things like this. In any case, this is quite astounding because inflection was on a trajectory like growth, 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 and being placing themselves as the alternative and the more personal and so on. But also, once you raise at such a high valuation, there's almost no way out. So tricky situation for them. In any case, I can probably think that their other investors <laughs> aren't going to be super happy that they put in a ton of money and now the bulk of the team just kind of moves over to Microsoft. CNBC writes, the world's first major act to regulate AI passed by European lawmakers. The AI Act is being pushed forward, has passed another major 
hurdle is expected to enter into force at the end of legislature in May after passing final checks and receiving endorsement from the European Council. So in all likelihood, the way that the AI Act is now is going to be its final form in how it's going to be enforced and uh, implemented in the various countries. This is being hailed, I guess. Europe is now a global standard setter in AI and artificial intelligence is already very much part of our daily lives. Now it will be part of our legislation too. I know the AI Act has been changed over the years and people are saying at least that it's not as draconian as it was originally intended, especially towards sort of research and towards open source models and so on. But still, I think the distinguishing the difference, the crap, the stark difference between, you know, over here being like open release of Grok one from a US company, another US company absolutely dominating the global chip market, making even better chips, even more, right? A billion dollar investments into companies, all of these news stories. And then what does Europe have to contribute? Or oh, we make it such that uh, people, uh, maybe they there is an announcement on the website that next to the cookie banner, there is now also an AI banner that informs them that uh, some parts of the website may be generated by an LLM. And <laughs> come, come on, come on, Europe. I know, I know the AI Act hasn't turned out as bad as it could have been. But is this a victory? Shouldn't we put our efforts towards making cool stuff? I don't know. You tell your parliament members. Are you happy with the cookie banner so far? Do you think they've majorly contributed towards the well-being of society? Or are companies just collecting even more data because now most people actually actively agree to accept all cookies. So they are even justified in collecting this data. Which of the two is it? Figure AI has slapped chat GPT into a humanoid robot and has uploaded interesting demonstrations for that. I'm a bit, I don't know. It's obviously cool. And I know that large language models can interact with robots and so on. And it seems to fit together well to have a control system that can do tasks and a large language model that has some kind of world knowledge and then connecting that. But here in this sense, they're like, oh, wow, it understood me. Well, the person has asked for like some food and there, <laughs> there was one single apple and nothing else in front of the robot. Uh, uh, I mean, I do believe in the future of robotics and the combination of robotics and sort of world models and generative AI and text models and so on. But it seems like it's more of a competition of who can make the most Hollywood-esque demonstration here rather than actual capabilities. Like also the fact that these robots are humanoid. Why? Why? Related TechCrunch writes, Mercedes begins piloting Aptronic humanoid robots in their factories. So they begin adding these into uh, low skill work in their factories. I mean, yes, I guess that could help. And OK, I want to retract my earlier statement. Maybe the humanoid form makes sense because these places like factories are already kind of built for humans to move in and to do stuff. So maybe that makes a little bit of sense, but I'm not sure there's got to be a better way. In any case, in factories, this could make a lot of sense. And we see major players in the field, major industrial players now deploying more and more of these robots first as experiments, but then also rolling them out generally. Also, this article from Axios de detailing new advancements of a company called Agility Robotics that delivers, again, humanoid robots to companies like Amazon and BMW. So there seems to be something to the humanoid form, not just me complaining. Last week, we have seen that India has made a so far non binding but strong recommendation for new AI deployments to be government approved or government reviewed or something like this, which has sparked a loud outcry <laughs> across the world. And that has now been retracted. India TechCrunch writes India drops plan to require approval for AI model launches. So walking back on a recent AI advisory, after receiving criticism from many local and global entrepreneurs and investors. Hey, Europe, look, look, it's possible. It's possible 
to overreach with legislation and then say, ah, maybe that was a bad idea. Let's not do it. Open Sora on GitHub has already almost 10,000 stars and is pushing for open models that can do what Sora is doing. So you can see a few examples right here. Now, as always, these things are going to be at a level that's kind of behind the commercial models. But I think the foray into open source large language model, open source language vision models, open source diffusion models and so on has brought many, many good things. So the foray into open source text to video models, I'm quite convinced will also yield similar results to the point where something like stable diffusion or so can already cover many, many use cases for many people that then don't need to go to a commercial vendor and will enable a lot of research as well. Daniel Hanchen on Reddit writes, Gemma fine tuning should be much better now. As we've also discussed last week, there have been multiple bugs, inconsistencies found in various implementations of Gemma, which mainly affected not only its inference, but also its fine tuning. So people have had quite poor results fine tuning Gemma. And a lot of that is due to the various bugs that have snuck in, for example, doing y times one divided by x versus y divided by x seems to have an influence on the position embeddings, like stuff like this, it takes dedication of people to figure out these are super silent bugs that you'll almost not find out unless you have hundreds of eyes looking at a code base and figuring out exactly where the differences are. People are making progress. And in this thread, there's also linked a collab for full fine tuning with all the bugs fixed. And yeah, Great success. I found this paper interesting. Apparently it's not on archive or not on archive yet, but this is research into how watching encrypted traffic from a large language model like ChatGPT can actually give insight into what the content is. And that is because if you stream token by token, the size of the encrypted message will give away sort of the length of the token, if you will, or at least the encoded length of the token. And from that, you can reverse engineer or do heuristic decoding like, okay, there is a two letter word followed by a five letter word followed by a three letter word and so on. And coincidentally, you can use a trained language models in order to take in that the length indications and then output a decoded or a guess at a decoded text. Obviously, the more specific your length inference is, the better you're able to decode that text. Very cool effect because previously we didn't really in such a large scale kind of stream things token by token with any major applications. And now that mode of communication has become more pervasive. And it seems like the classical sort of security considerations are to a degree vulnerable to that new method. Ian Morrow releases fuzz types. Fuzz types is a library to autocorrect data that comes from LLMs. So let's say you actually expect some sort of date time to come back from your LLM. This thing will not only parse the date time, but if it's a bit fuzzy, it will correct it for you. So that's the idea of the library. Very cool. Uh, you can check that out, probably extend it. Yeah, check it out. Olama supports AMD graphics card now. Olama is a library for running inference of not only Llama models, but everything's called Llama now that sort of deals with LLMs. This is fast inference for generative language models and now supporting AMD graphics cards. Excellent. Apple releases MM1, a investigation into scaling and training multimodal large language models. They're saying they've trained a family of multimodal models, including dense variants up to 30 billion parameters and mixture of experts variants up to up to 64 billion parameters that are state of the art in pre training metrics and achieve competitive performance after supervised fine tuning on a range of established multimodal benchmarks. The interesting part here is that they did a lot of ablations and investigations into actually what makes multimodal training successful. And they show that image encoder together with image resolution and the image token count have a substantial impact while the vision language connection connector design is of comparatively negligible 
important. Further, they demonstrate that for large multimodal pre-training, using a careful mix of image caption, interleaved image text, and text-only data is crucial for achieving state-of-the-art few shot results across multiple benchmarks. The data mix and how you construct that data mix and how you feed it seems to be one of the most important parts in training multimodal models. More insight into this is absolutely welcome, as that is probably going to be one place where the open source community can benefit most like general training recipes for these kinds of models because there's just not as much capacity to do large ablation grid search like a company as Apple has. So very cool. Lavag connects internet browsing to large language models. So agent like interactions with websites by large language models. You can see it continuously kind of asks you what to do or you can input prompts into that and it will interact with the website in the way that you want it. So it's like sitting next to someone and instructing them how to do a certain task on a website, except that the model interacts with the website for you. I think this is pretty cool. And is probably one of the main considerations in sort of building the autonomous agents that people thought of even 10 years ago, like, oh, make a trip for me to the Bahamas, and then it will navigate and book flights and so on. Once it can interact with a website like a human would, that is one of the core pieces in achieving that. Google Research releases Chain of Table. This is an iteration of Chain of Thought in a way. Uh, so the idea is if you have tabular data and you want to infer something from that tabular data, sometimes it's not enough to just write sort of an, an SQL query for it. For example, this table here on the left hand side, you can see that uh, unfortunately, the country code is like embedded in the name column. And therefore, it's not as easy to build a query right here. So what chain of table does is it iteratively constructs additional columns to the table that are computed from other columns. So it will add columns, add headers, as you can see right here, do new columns. So essentially, it constructs intermediate tables on its way to achieving a goal, and therefore can give better answers. I think rather than just focusing on tables, I think the inference here is that if you let or guide the such a language model to do intermediate steps, and we've already seen this with like think step by step and yeah, chain of thought and so on, then it will more easily achieve its goal. And that just the fact that it requires less sort of latent planning of the language model, because just by saying things step by step, or just by training it or prompting it to do extra columns and tables, you are guiding it in the strategy on how to achieve a goal. So thinking how to think is probably one of the things these language models aren't good at by themselves. So giving them that structure, so they just kind of need to fill in the content in this structure is of much advantage. CNBC writes Alphabet shares up 4% on report Apple is in talks to license Gemini AI for iPhones. Now this is someone said that someone said, according to a Bloomberg report, Apple is in talks with Alphabet on Google to let the iPhone maker license and build its Gemini AI engine into the iPhone. People familiar with the matter. <laughs> I guess, you know how people say 4chan is just one website of a guy called Anonymous. I'm pretty sure all the news organizations just have one phone number <laughs> that's called people familiar with the matter. And there's just one guy like sending <laughs> various tips to all the news organizations and making up stuff. I don't know. I don't know. Supposedly, these news orgs kind of check the background of the people that where they have the info from, but also they're really iffy on getting the next news story out and scooping everyone else. So I'm not sure. Every time you read people familiar with the matter, I don't know, I think of like this meme on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Google has released a blog post titled New Ways We're Tackling Spammy Low Quality Content on Search. This goes into the details of reducing spam search result, reducing sort of targetly search engine optimized things and other spammy stuff. I have tried to read this, but it's really devoid of any information except for saying, oh, we uh, do stuff in order to make stuff better. <laughs> We're tuning our ranking system to reduce unhelpful, unoriginal content on search 
and keep it at very low levels. Yeah, that's what a search engine is supposed to do. I don't know why they released this blog. Probably somebody got some money for successfully completing a project and then making some press out of it, but it's devoid of any information. Stability introduces Stable Video 3D, which is based on stable video diffusion. This is a model that could take a single picture and sort of make an orbital view around it. Yeah, very cool. As I said, the foray into more video based models, text to video and so on, or image to video, all this kind of stuff is excellent. And lastly, Cohere announces Cohere Embed V3, which is a another instance of an embedding model Cohere very much going into embedding models. And obviously, having Niels Reimers on board is a big asset in that the new thing right here is that they support int eight and binary embeddings. And that allows you to save a lot on storage and memory that is required in order to hold these embeddings in memory. So traditionally, if you do FP32 embeddings, then you use what well, they claim here, you require like 2.8 terabyte of memory, and you get huh, search quality. But with one bit embeddings, you are using Oh, look at that only 30 gigabytes of memory, and you're getting better search quality. Now, I don't doubt the ability of cohere to train good embeddings. I mean, some of these things are the trade offs are chosen very carefully, right? For example, here, you have 3000 dimensional embeddings at float 32. So probably people would quantize that now way and do some sort of dimensionality reduction. So that would bring the memory needed here down significantly. And we don't exactly know how much of a hit that would do to the search quality here. If you kept the one bit embeddings at the same dimension, how much that would do and so on carefully chosen comparisons. I'm they're absolutely true from what I can tell, or at least I believe them. But <laughs> yeah, in any way, Cohere, they do release these things, as far as I know, for free for research. And if you want to use them commercially, you'll have to give them some money. All right, that was it. Monday over. Keep hydrated. Stay drinking. Goodbye. <laughs>